it's always flattering to think that somebody would even invite me to come talk about this stuff. So I appreciate it. I hope I can teach you a few things today uh, about the markets and about how I see the markets. So let's begin with that. We'll start with my PowerPoint, which is, I think, a really a, a huge important question. Can cycles help us see the future? I mean, we really have to get that answered. Uh, there's so much stuff about cycles out there that uh, doesn't work, hasn't worked, and we need to get some factual analysis about what does work with cycles. Uh, everything has limits in life, and I think some people take the potential for cycles way beyond uh, the reality of cycles. So I'm going to try to document some of this. Are we just kidding ourselves? We need proof. So I'm going to give you some proof, and then I'm going to show you how you can do this as well. This is a forecast we made in 2023, my natural cycle forecast. That was the cycle forecast. And then this is what actually happened in the market itself. So uh, to me, cycles are largely a, a two things. A setup tool that says I want to be looking for sales at this time of the year, taking profits. I want to look for buyers over here, uh, an entry in the market. If I like the stock, I'll talk more about that. So it, it's, it's a long-term version one of my real thoughts in 2023 is to be successful, uh, you you need to have perspective and patience. So how do you get perspective? Well, you read somebody who's very bullish or bearish, I mean, maybe it gives you perspective, but if they're wrong, you're really lost. I think cycles give you perspective of the overall trend of the market and when the best points to be a buyer or a seller are. Then that allows patience. That allows patience so you can persevere. You, you have perspective and, you know, the markets are tough, but how do you persevere? Well, uh, here's a good case. I started buying the S&P in here heavily and, and um, I got losses here. I got losses over here, but I had perspective so I could persevere through this and I had a huge, huge run. You can only imagine because I, I really loaded up in the market in here of what's happened on this rally. So cycles give us perspective that allows us to persevere. It gives us some patience in the market, like when to wait for this time. So I think that's how I use cycles in terms of, of using them as a trader or looking into the markets. Here's a little more proof of the markets. This is the forecast we did for 2023 for Nevada, one of, of course, the big all-time stocks. And you can see this is the path we thought from July into the end of the year be a 90% probability of a rally in the market. And these are when the significant lows and highs should come. Those are the buying opportunities in the market. That was made a year in advance, okay? How did it come out? Well, there's the lows. You can see what happened in the market. There's that rally that we saw that we would see from over here. So it, it, it is possible to generally predict what's going on, but am I going to predict the absolute hour. I think there's too much erratic activity in the market, too much irrational stuff, news, whatever happening, that I think I'm going to absolutely call the absolute high of the day or well, the low of the market. I'm more concerned about, oh, that's the path. I want to look for be a buyer in these areas. That's how I use this stuff. Here's a forecast for you for 2024. This is an actual forecast. Uh, we're making for Rockwell. So about January 8th, I would expect this market to come down until about the middle of May, rally up to around the first part of August, pull back into the 10th of August, uh, 10th of October, and start to rally again. However, there's something called inversion in cycles. My good friend and Jake's good friend, Wells Wilder, uh, Jake traveled all over the world with Wells. And uh, I've met Wells and helped him actually help Wells get going in the business. Wells said cycles can invert. And I said, oh, that just means that the cycle was wrong. He said, no, he called it an inversion. If a top became a bottom, I said, you're dead wrong. He said, no, it's an inversion. And I've come to believe that Wells was really on to something. So it could be... Let's say that Rockwell rallies all year long. Then if it rallies up in here, that May uh, 13th time period would be a peak in the market. So these dates are equally important and there should be a cycle reversal. And this is the important thing about cycles here. This is when the cycle should reverse. 
maybe the cycle is going down. It doesn't matter if the cycle is going down or up. There's a reversal at these time periods. That's my expectation. Also, huge important thing. People think that cycles predict the magnitude of a price move. It looks like a big price rally, a big price drop. No. Why? Cycles measure time. They don't measure magnitude. Cycles are how many days, how many years, how many months. They're measuring time, and they might get the length of the time move from here to here, but the magnitude, the price scale, which we're where we get paid over here, is not a part of cycles. That's something else that we really haven't quite captured, and at least I haven't, in, in my meager cycle studies. So I know there's, since we've been rallying, there should be a peak in the market. That should be a low in the market. But as we get into May, we'll look and see, are we in phase with the cycle? If so, then we're going to see a rally here. So that's how we can forecast out in advance. The red line is a longer term trend of the market. So we can get a kind of an intermediate term, that's the blue line, and then a red line, a longer term view of the market. And there could be a contradiction. They are always in agreement, but that's the markets. We don't have perfection in the markets and I'll be talking about that a little bit later, but there's, there's an actual forecast you can see, and you can take that into the future. There's more to cycles than just stocks. So I think so many of focus on a 32 day cycle in the stock market or in Tesla or whatever. I want to go beyond that. And I think there's a wealth of information for investors and stock traders. If we, we get away from price for a little bit, I'm going to show how we can use this cycles on other things. And here's why. Uh, I, I'm a graduate from the School of Journalism, University of Oregon. And I, one of the very best classes I had was logic from Professor Albury Castell. I'll never forget that guy. And in my logic class, one of the first things I learned, because I didn't know anything about logic. I was a football player and art major. I didn't know about this educational stuff. He said, you cannot predict A with A. That made a lot of sense to me, but as technicians, we've been trying to predict price with price since the first chart was developed. And it's a, it's illogical. So we say, well, we're predicting the momentum of price, not just price. But I, I wanted to back away from that and try to predict A with B or C or D. I think that can be more effective. So I turned my cycle studies to things like inflation. And the black line you see is inflation, their CPI index. And this is a forecast I made in 2021, the end of 2021. And the cycle said inflation should start to go down. Now, if that's true, and if you know that, you're way ahead of the game. This is the way it came out. There's a CPI and there's a cycle inflation. It looks like around 2026, we'll start to pick up on inflation again. My big point here is we can use cycles to predict exogenous data to the stock market. So our stock market predictions will be better because they're based on something outside of just price. They're based on things that actually really drive price. Inflation is hugely important to the stock market. I think we all know that, but how do we apply that? And I think we can apply that by using what we see here, cycles to help us give a sense of where we are within the structure of the fundamentals of the market. Here's another one. This is another forecast we did in 2022, at the end of 2022. The green line is money supply. And I found that GDP, which is black, can be predicted by money supply, the cycle of money supply. So the cycle of money supply is green. And as you can see, GDP follows that pretty well, which I thought at the end of 2022 meant GDP would pick up in 2023, which meant there would not be a recession. All the media mongrels forecasting the huge recession of 2023, uh, rich dad, poor dad guys said it would be the worst crash ever. Jimmy Rogers, the worst crash of his lifetime. The guy at Morgan Stanley, a 30, 40% decline in stock prices, big recession we're going to enter. Well, 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 hold on. If money supply predicts GDP and it looks like they kind of match each other, 
then we can see that that cycle money supply says that GDP would go up in 2023 and there would not be a recession. And this is how it came out. That's what happened in 2023, GDP went up. So we knew it would go up here, believe it would go up because of a cyclical study. So the study of cycles is just hugely important to go beyond just looking at a stock or a stock market index. It gives us a better understanding of the world that we live in. So here's my very long-term outlook on stock prices. I thought I'd share that with you. This is a report also made a couple of years ago. Basically, we should rally up into a peak of somewhere at the end of 2025, 26, 85% probability of a rally. You can see a strong rally coming here, maybe the last bull market for a while. Then we start to go down into 2032. That scares me. I don't know what that's going to do, but that bothers me the most at this time in terms of long term. So I've been really bullish on the market the last couple, three years. Actually, since the pandemic low, we bought the week of the low when uh, mad money saying buy the week of the low. And again, the week of the low in 2022. Um, so I've been really bullish in the market, but I see I'm going to probably start to have to change that bullish. I'm not always bullish that we may be seeing something happening in 2026, like something we've seen before, and it won't be the rip-roaring bull market we've seen. So this is the thing that worries me the most. It's still out there in the future. We need to get more data. We'll see what's happening with inflation, money supply, GDP, all those things once we get there. But looking at just price cycle, that's my worry point in the marketplace. I'm going to take a new look at the decennial pattern. You know, this is based on a 10-year pattern in here. That's a decenni decennial pattern. And we're going to look at a new way of looking at the decennial pattern this year. I, this is the first time it's been presented by anybody, by me, or I, I think it is an original idea no one has ever worked with before. And I thought I'd share it with the foundation. I hope you'll enjoy it. We are standing on the shoulders of giants, whether it's Dewey or Banner with the Banner's properties written a couple hundred years ago. Gann, who I certainly don't always agree with. I think a lot of Gann stuff, he had some horrible prediction. But he opened our minds to look at the market in a different way. Edgar Lawrence Smith, I'm going to talk about him in a moment. I mean, so many people in cycle, Jake Bernstein in cycle work. Uh, we're standing on a lot of other shoulders, and I'm just a guy standing on the shoulders. If you go back to the New York Times in 1931, they talked about a conference of economic and beyond economic analysis. And they said the most remarkable feature of the conference is a great amount of evidence as to a cycle of nine to 10 years. That was in 1931. Edgar Lawrence Smith had written a book called Tides in the Affairs of Men. I first read this book when I got involved in markets in 1962. I wish I would have paid more attention to it. Like it's a little thin book. Uh, it's it's just a wealth of information. Now, Edgar Lawrence Smith is an interesting man. He was the one who ultimately wrote the paper that changed Wall Street. Prior to Edgar Lawrence Smith's work, everybody bought bonds and said bonds would outperform stocks. But Edgar Lawrence Smith's main paper said that stocks on a long-term basis would outperform bonds. Who grabbed onto that paper? A guy named Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett became an advocate of Edgar Lawrence Smith for that fundamental consideration. I have because of his cyclical work. His 1930 postulate was there appears to be a tendency towards decennial reoccurrence and major stock price movements. In other words, well, there's about a 10-year pattern in the marketplace. And I found that to be generally correct. It's something I look at every year. It's a generally good idea. Now, Newton's law, as we all know, says an object once in motion tends to stay in motion. And I think that has application to cycles, especially the decennial pattern. If we look at the same year as Edgar Lawrence Smith did, all years ending in two, say 1902, 1912, 1922, they don't all match. Some are more in alignment with others, but usually all two years trade about the same. And I started thinking about that. Well, 
some years, these two years don't match the way all two years transpired. What happens when the following years, the market doesn't respond to the two-year pattern? And this is what I noticed. And my, my postulate is an object in motion stays on the same path. What do I mean by that? The years, the two years that match the current two year the most, that pattern will probably continue the following year. In other words, that motion stays on the same path. I'm going to give you some examples of that now. Here was my original work. In 2008, I took all of the years ending in ed uh, in, in uh, 8, uh, 1908, 1928, 1938, 48, 58, 68, 78, got it all. Of, and on average, that's the way all years ending in, in 8 have traded. It was a horrible forecast for 2008. Uh, it was totally wrong. Now, what's going on? What? So I started working on this in 2009, 2010, 2011, and I came up with this idea. What if I took all the years that best fit to 2007 and then for, saw what happened in the eight years after that? So I'm trying to be clear here. So I looked at the years that were the best fit to 2007, and then took just those eight years the next year and extended that out of time. And that's this path, which was a whole lot better. Was it perfect? No. Did get, get the first of the year rally, got the break, got the rally, got the huge sell off and the decline at the end of the year. So I thought, hey, I'm on to something here. I got something. This is really interesting. And I've been working with that since. And that's what I'll be talking about and explaining to you today. Here's an, another example. Um, we're looking at 2000, uh, all years that end in two in red and in blue are the years that best fit. So then the question is, if this is all years in two. These are the years that bet fit. What happened the following year? And here's the following years in red. Well, it wasn't that good of a fit, but look how closely the best fit years were. In other words, these best fit years continued in the future. The next year is what you see in blue as a better pattern than just the red pattern. This was a much better pattern. So I think I'm on to something here that, you know, I don't have a background or training in math, so you're going to be a lot better at this than I am. Um, and you may be able to carry this farther than I've carried it, but I think I'm really on to something here. We'll continue with that. I took all the patterns in 2019, this is 2019, and all nine years are in red. So it will be uh, 1909, 1919, 1929, 39, 49, 59, 69. That red line is all years ending in nine. And the nine year was kind of close. It wasn't bad. And, but then the blue line is the, the years, I forget what they were, let's say 1919, 1949, and 1979 were the years that were most like 2019. Got it? This is all nine years. These are the years that best fit 2019. So how did that carry forward into 2020? And here's what happened. The all years didn't do that well. And the best fit years did a really good job of predicting what would happen in 2023. So I think that there is this carryover effect. In other words, if you can find the years in the decennial pattern, not all years, but just in the decennial pattern, if you look at, say, uh, and we'll look in a moment, a forecast for 2024, if you look at all the three years, uh, 1903, 13, 23, 33, you'll get a pattern of how a three year should trade. If we then look at how the three year this year traded and find the years that traded the most like this three year, we can then extend that out into the next year to get a better forecast than the original decennial pattern that Edgar Lawrence Smith wrote about. I hope that's clear. Uh, this is the first time I've talked about it, first time I've tried to explain it. 
So I hope it's clear. So here we take uh, all nine years and there's the blue is the best fit. And I just have noticed this over and over again. We take the 2019 matched years, that's the best match, the blue line, versus all nine years. And then we carry into 2020, the best fit blue line called the crash, if you will, the rallies and the strong end year end rally, whereas all uh, 20 years didn't fit that nearly as well, carrying them forward. They called for a big rally when we didn't have it. So again, we see this idea of best fit may be the way to handle the decennial cycle. Going just a little bit further, the purple line now is all years ending in the zero. So this would be the decennial pattern itself. But if we took those from the best fit, we get a much better example of a forecast for the market. Is it highly accurate? No. Do I have better ways of forecasting the market? Yes. But generally speaking, most people want a quick and dirty way of forecasting the market. Most people are aware of the decennial pattern. And I think this is the way to do it based on the assumption of cycles of repetitive action in the marketplace. Let's take a look at 2021 to forecast 2022. The red line is all years ending in one. And this is the black line, of course, is 2021. And it wasn't the perfect match. It called a rally at the first of the year, a rally here. But the best fit, those are the years that best fit 2021. There were some years that ended in a one in that decennial pattern that were a best fit to 2021. So how did that carry forward into 2022 as follows? The blue years got the high, whereas the red years said the high of the year would come over here. Wrong. And they both were in pretty good sync rest of time. But on balance, the blue line did better than the red line. In other words, those select years that were most like the last year predicted better than all years. Then uh, we can see all, all years in two are blue line, and they did okay. But again, the prediction from the prior years did better. So uh, where are we right here right now, right? What's going to happen in 2024? That's why you're here today. That's why you're watching, right? Um, this would be the projection. If we take all years in all three years in red, that projects out like this. If we took the ones that best fit 2023, that projects like this. Actually, quite a bit of a difference. We see the best buy point would be August, the middle of October, and a strong year-end rally. So for those of you who have followed the decennial pattern, I know the Foundation of Cycles have a lot of work on the decennial pattern. Uh, I think we have a new way of looking at it. If you pull out those years, that best fit the current year, then take those next 12 months forward, you get a better projection of what should happen. Perfect projection? No. Are there better projections? Yeah, I think so. I do that in my cycle forecast I do every year. But it's a pretty doggone good way of getting a quick and dirty projection of what's going to happen. And that projection says a rally first of the year come down and we end up higher for the year. That will continue in a bull market. At the end of 2025, or 2024 rather, you'd see which markets best fit 2024, and then take those years to make a projection to 2025. I'd like to say it's just that simple. I hope that that's been simple enough uh, for you to understand. So if we use 2024 using all years ending in four, that's a light blue line. It, that would be the typical decennial pattern versus the one I just explained to you. So you can get a look at that. You'll probably want to take screenshots of this or rewatch it on YouTube or whatever. But I, I, this is experimental stuff. I mean, I don't have enough data to go way out of them and say, this is the ultimate answer. And there's no ultimate answer anyway to this stuff. But it's a good way. We'll look back at the end of the year and see if, again, which worked out the best. The decennial pattern or my, if you will, new and improved way of uh, using the decennial pattern to help us get a glimpse of, of what could happen in the future. 
I want to talk a little bit about some things I've been seeing recently. Is less better. Uh, big data, using it's the hardest part. I think a lot of cycle people have made an error in their cycle studies. And I'd like to show that to you in the next few charts. Uh, I think this is a real important point to make. So watch carefully if you would. Here is the 18.6 year cycle in the Dow Jones Industrial Average as of 1966. And that said the market from 1966 should go crashing down to 1970. We actually had a large rally and then we did have a decline. But just when it said we should have had a rally is when the decline happened. So that 18.6 year cycle starting with all this is data out of sample. If we look at 18.6 years starting in 1966, it didn't do a very good job. If we come forward to 2008, it did an even worse job. If we start the 18.6 year cycle data from here backwards, we get that we should have been in a big, strong bull market, and we weren't. Why is that? Especially when it looks like the 18.6 year cycle could be such a good cycle. Here's a blow up of that. There's the 18.6 year cycle with data back in this time period, no data forward. And we should have rallied, dipped, rallied. Well, we did that part of it, but cool. Wow, not a good call at all. Why? I think because of 1929. The data from 1929, 1930 is so strong, it permeates the data. So if we look at the S&P 500 that does not have 1929 in the data, we get a very different picture of 2008. We should have a big decline in the market and a big rally. Whoa, that was much more correct. We should rally up into the 2008, the middle of 2008, come down. Why is this different than this one? Because there's more data in this one, and this one includes a huge data outlier of 1929. I think you have to be careful about using data from 1929. Here's the 18.6 year cycle in the Dow Jones Industrial Average now using data from 1929 that suggests we rally and come down to a low in here. But we should have topped out way back here and been in a big bear market from 1921 to 1925. That's the hangover influence of data from 1929. If we look at the S&P, SANS data from 1929, we get a very different picture, don't we? We get a nice rally going into this time period. 2024 should be up most of the year, year-end rally, whereas we see just the opposite. And this, which one's right? Well, we don't know for sure, because 2024 is not over. But I suspect that that hangover effect of 1929, which is still in this data, is just too all-encompassing, and this is the better view to follow than the Dow Jones average, that that data is so strong from 1929 that it has a bad influence in the data. The metonic cycle has been another one, kind of a lunar cycle a lot of people talked about. If we look at that, you really see the 1929 bias a whole lot more. Uh, right now, it looks like we're in a huge decline in the market. We should see Remember, this is using data from 1929. If we look at the S&P data, whoa, it's a totally different ballgame here, isn't it? It actually says we should start to rally here. And it's done a much better job. It's not my favorite cycle, by the way. It's not even one that I use, but it's a popular one. A lot of people follow it. I think there's a lot better cycles to follow. But it's done a lot better job on the data without 1929 in it then it has, we should have been a buyer over here a little early, then it has in the S&P with data from 1929. So I'm going to kind of rest my case on that with that chart. I think that there is a big difference. And you've got to be careful of this, of using too much data. Uh, or at least if you're going to use, say, the decennial pattern and you're looking at all years ending in nine, you probably want to, kick out 1929, because that data swing is so heavy in the data, it's going to uh, eat up all rest of the data, and you'll just be looking at 1929. 
I, I, here's another good example. If you want to do a, an analysis of the commodity market index, uh, if you study it closely, you'll see that the CRB or the Goldman Sachs index is almost totally influenced by crude oil. If you take crude oil out of it, it's a totally different index. So one thing can balance, you overbalance whatever you're looking at. And my point here is you need to deal with that in some way if you're using the Dow Jones Industrial Average stuff with the, the crash of 29 in it, or if you're looking at the CRB index or Goldman Sachs index, and crude oil is predominantly the major of the market. We have that right now, though. The FANG stocks accounted, what, about 40% of the activity in the market last year. So again, you have to watch your data and understand what's in your data. Another good example of it, if you go back and study the bond market, Jake will remember this. In the 1980s, or a big bond market rallies on Thursdays. And if you look at that data, you're going to get a really good trading system with Thursdays, and that falls apart. But who's there? What was, well, there used to be a, a government report that came out every Thursday and drove the bond market wild. Then they stopped doing it. Or back in uh, 1970, the stock market didn't trade on Wednesdays. There was so much volume, they closed the market down on Wednesdays, pre-computer. So I could handle the paperwork all done by hand. So Wednesdays didn't even exist in the 1970s. So you need to understand your data. And I think a big understanding of data in the S&P uh, comes from you got to be careful about using data that's heavily biased. You can wash that bias out, um, but you don't want to use a lot of data without cleansing the data from 1929 uh, for the obvious reasons that you can see. Um, Here's my true confession. I'm a recovering perfectionist. And that's a problem. You don't want to be a perfectionist as a commodity trader because there's nothing perfect about this business. The only perfect cycle is one examine after the fact. There are no perfect cycles other than that one. Uh, somebody, I just did my 2024 report and somebody said, how good is it? I said, it's a really good, it's a 2023 forecast report. And we perfectly forecast 2023 because you can do that. But the future, I'm going to vary a little bit. But I firmly believe that the markets are predestined to act in a certain way, which means I firmly believe the news of the day really doesn't mean very much. It'll cause an erratic fluctuation, but the market's going to go where it's going to go. Uh, and I think that's an important lesson that if you get in phase with that longer term trend of the market through cycles, uh, they're not worried about the short term fluctuations of the marketplace. The things I know about cycles, I think weekly works best for forecasting. Again, I'm not a day trader, so I'm not interested in even there's too much erratic action, I think, for day trading. Very short term, too erratic, is way too random. So I like to work on weekly data. And cycles are better at timing than magnitude. We talked about that earlier. Remember, cycles measure time, 32 days, 62 days, 435 years, whatever. They don't measure price movement this way. They measure primarily time. So they're not really good at magnitude. So the fact that we're high, low, high, low, that's just the way cycles operate. It doesn't mean you're going to have a huge rally. It means we should have a bullish influence from here to over here, but we'll show that with a line, of course, that goes up. They're not a be-all, end-all. I see them as a setup tool, uh, and they are not good, at least in the stock market, at predicting tops. They might be miserable at predicting tops in the marketplace, and here's why. It's a really important point. So many people have called the top in the market using a seven-year cycle, and the market never topped or a 10-year cycle, or an eight-year cycle, or whatever. Why? Because the stock market shows a strong upward drift, upward bias. It, it always goes up. So the tops we do get in the market don't last very long. The 2008 decline lasted, what, nine, 10 months? That was it. And the market went right back up again. So cycles, at least for the stock market indexes, don't call market tops very well. That's where I think we could bring in fundamental data that is a lot better job of calling market tops than trying to call market tops with cycles in the stock market is really hard. Now, commodities are different. 
commodities are boof, up, up, up. They go up and they go down. They're boom, bust, boom, bust. Because commodities go from um, oversupply to undersupply. So they're, they're very erratic. They don't have long-term drift. You look, the price of sugar goes up, comes down, goes up, comes down. We eat the same thing. Years ago, Jimmy Rogers had a commodity fund. He said, oh, commodity will go up in his very big commodity bull market. They did. They went up, down, up, down. When there's too much wheat, uh, prices come down. And if the wheat's too high, people will, or say cattle too high, they'll buy pork or chicken. And so then nobody has cattle and there's no cattle. And then cattle goes up because nobody had any cattle to produce cattle. Commodities are a boom bust market. They cycle differently than stocks. Gold, a boom bust market. Gold is driven by commercials. It's a commodity that's used, consumed, and produced. I love Sean Hannity. I love to listen to his radio show until they put on the gold commercial. Buy gold. It'll protect you from that. Gold's a commodity. It goes up and it goes down. I hate to spoil your dream about gold protecting you. It isn't going to protect you from anything. Oh, when we inflate, gold will go way up. We inflated the last two years and gold went down. Well, how about in a major stock market crash like 2008 when gold went down? Or the panic of uh, 2020, gold went down. Or the crash of, you know, whenever markets crash, gold crashes too. So there's this whole emotional thing, which is an old wives' tale, that in a uh, recession, gold will go up, but no, it goes down. In a stock market panic, Gold will go up. No, it goes down. And I used to think in inflation, gold goes up because it did until about 10 years ago, we would inflate and gold wouldn't go up. I believe gold is a commercially driven market. So you want to look at the commitment trade report, look at cycles. There's some strong cycles in gold. You want to focus on that if you're going to focus on gold. Well, that ends it. If you're interested in my report of uh, forecasts for 2024, you can go to our website, iRudyTrade.com. I have been doing these uh, forecast reports now for 18 years. Uh, I'm still not perfect at it, but I'm not bad at it. So we do uh, 30 or 40 stocks, all commodities, all major stock market indexes of the world. I do my cycle forecast on it. So we want to go into more depth, go to iRudyTrade.com, and you can see some free forecasts there and all sorts of stuff that would help you maybe understand what's going to happen in 2024. And uh, Ron, we probably have some questions that come in or Maybe I put everybody to sleep. I don't know. And I am not hearing you, Ron. Ron, you're muted. Got it. I, I was just saying, everyone's wide awake and uh, have been pinging with uh, a, a great flow of questions. So I'm keen to follow up on, on the wonderful presentation with the questions. Uh, right at the top, Larry, if I can. Your market view, in, in a nutshell, whether it be market, economy, I find it quite interesting the point that you made about markets tend to drift up with that natural skew. Uh, and so sometimes looking at price, A plus A will still likely give you a variation of A. So looking at some of that fundamental data uh, with cycle uh, projections, what does that say to you for markets this well, year? Well, we're, we're in a bull market. Um well, yeah, so you want, which means in 2024, you want to buy big market breaks and sell big market rallies. We're in a bull market. Don't believe the Cassandras, the purveyors of pessimism will be proven wrong one more time. Now, another year or so, they're going to be right. They're right here, right now. Don't listen to these guys. We are in a bull market. Thank you. Uh, uh, follow up question on the decennial cycle. And the, uh, there's a, uh, one on um, the best fit uh, framing that you, that you explained uh, from Richard, our FSC chairman. How do you decide if a past decennial year was a good fit with the most recent year? Well, the software that I use allowed me to do that. It'll it'll show which years were with the percentage the closest best fit. So I'm able to do that mathematically. Wonderful. And then a follow up question from myself, Larry. I, I've been a Big fan of uh, uh, cycles in general, your work, of course, along with uh, all other pioneers in this field. And the work of Edward Dewey's, uh, of, of um, Edward Dewey, I was about to say Edward Dewey, but in this case, uh, Edgar Lawrence Smith has always been interesting to me, particularly his original book, uh, Tides and Affairs of Men. 
Um, there's a quote I have here from that book, and I just want to run it by you, Larry, in the sense that um, an interpretation of his uh, uh, cycle, his decennial cycle, was combining two periods. And that was apparently the 10-year cycle was a mix of 120-month cycle, um, uh, which would result in a 12-month uh, uh, pattern, uh, annual cycles with three 40-month cycles, and, and they would coincide every 10 years. It, it sounds a little bit intricate, and I'm just wondering um, how clear that was on, on the first read. Well, I, I think there's a lot of information in his book. Uh, and I today just went at the big, broader one he's most known for, the decennial pattern. But yeah, those other patterns, the yearly pattern, the 44, 45 presidential pattern, those are all interesting cycles you need to look at as well, for sure. He was okay. so far ahead of his time. And then just as a, uh, a final point on on uh, Lawrence's work, he, he spent some time trying to work out why, uh, what that driver was. <laughs> Sorry to ask that rabbit hole question, but <laughs> do you find yourself asking why? And if so, what answers have you come up with? For a long time, I asked myself why these cycles happen. And some people say weather, some say uh, astrology, some say whatever. You know what? I decided just not to get in God's way. What's going to happen is going to happen. And I, I am certainly not nearly intelligent enough to have the answer to that. But I am relatively intelligent enough to be able to follow these cycles and take advantage of them and use them in my own life. But the broader, the big, broad question, uh, boy, I'm not the guy. <laughs> just, I'm, I just don't have any idea. I've got ideas, but, you know, I'm, uh, they're, they're meaningless. Focus on the effect, not the cause. <laughs> I, 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 resonate with that truth. Uh, Bill's asking, do you have a, any correlation with seasonality? I know that's a big feature of your toolkit, Larry. Well, yeah, I think seasonality, here's the point. Seasonality is how the markets have traded on average in the past. So usually gold rallies in August. That doesn't mean it will rally in August this year, but on average, that's how it's rallied in the past. The cycles are more into how it's trading right here, right now because it's taking the last three, two years, five years, whatever it is, whereas the seasonality is in the last 100 years or however many years you're studying. So I think the cycles are more like right here, right now uh, than the seasonality. And the ideal thing, when they coincide, they don't always, but if you have the patience and you have the perspective, because we can see in advance when seasonals and when cycles coincide, then you just have to be patient to wait for it. Like, you know, that's like shooting ducks in a barrel. And in terms of looking at cycles on, on um, non-price data, so we looked at economic data uh, just at the top. There's, there's some questions here about what about uh, sentiment data in terms of commitment of traders? Is that something that you've looked at and, and what's been the usefulness? Yeah, you know, like probably Jake can appreciate the most. I think Jake and I have looked at everything over the last 60, 62 years I've been doing it. So I can't remember some of this stuff. But the, the commitment to trade report, I don't know that it's, you can put cycles on it, but I'm just more concerned about what their their position is right here, right now. Uh, if they get heavily long, the market's probably going to have a rally pretty soon. Um, I don't know that their action is all that cyclical. There's cycles to it, but I just use it more to see when they've been heavy buyers or heavy sellers. And then just to close, uh, Larry, uh, another market question, but different asset class. Uh, what are your top views on commodities? Well, the fluctuate. <laughs> um, uh, well, I'm I'm long crude oil right now, so we're talking like right here, right now. I think a unique situation is in the soybean market and the grain market. Wheat has been stronger than soybeans, so my preference is the wheat. But what I notice about soybeans, we're not talking cycles now, is that the commercials are now net long. They have not been net long this market for a long time. And when they do get net long, that's an abnormality. And in the past, it's been particularly bullish. So I've been stopped out once. Uh, but I'm looking for some type of a move. So now you can bring cycles in to figure out when that move should happen. But uh, that's one market that really uh, stands out to me 
uh, immediately right now, and the crude oil market does, of course. Mm-hmm. Hold on, my phone rang. I apologize about that. My best friend calling me. We'll have to call him back a little bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> all good. Live is live. It's all part of the fun. Thank you so much, uh, Larry Williams. We've had a, a great flurry of, of uh, gratitude and thanks from everyone here at the Foundation Study of Cycles and the members that are tuning in live on YouTube. Uh, more questions uh, are still following and we'll be sure to follow up um, on email uh, to, to try and get those answers back to them. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, and it thanks the Foundation for doing what they do to keep this study of cycles going. I mean, that's, that's great that w- what Richards have done to, to reignite this and get it going again, because clearly we can get a glimpse of the future. God doesn't, doesn't gonna let us see all of the future, but we can get a little glimpse of the future. And if we do that, we're ahead of the next guy, which means we can be a better investor, a better trader. And the, the only way I know, the only way to get a glimpse of the future is with cycles. <laughs>